You're watching ITV1. Now, the ITV Evening News with Mark Austin and Mayor Nightingale and Calendar with Jeff Truitt and Christine Talbot. It's six o'clock. Hello, it's Thursday the 19th of February. You're watching Calendar. On tonight's programme, a police escort for the final journey of a mother who was murdered along with her two daughters. And conned the bogus callers who are making life a misery for Yorkshire's elderly people. And I'm in Wakefield where there have been three accidents already on this particular stretch of road in just a week. Residents here say a speed camera is essential or someone is going to be killed. And all this on the day that one of our top police officers say speed cameras are wrecking his forces' relationship with the public. Speed cameras, right or wrong? We'll be asking that question during the programme. Thanks, Christine. Well, today, an entire community turned out to say their last farewells to a mother and her two daughters who were murdered in their own home. The funeral service was a celebration of the lives of Joanne Catley and her girls, Phoebe and Emma. They were all stabbed at their home near Grimsby. Their father's body was later found under the Humber Bridge. Here's Tina Gelder. It was a heartbreaking sight. The tiny white coffins of Phoebe and Emma Hicks were followed by their mothers. And today, Joanne Catley was laid to rest alongside her little angels. Joanne, who was 33, and the two girls, aged four and two, were found dead at their home in Healing. They'd been stabbed by their father, Joanne's estranged partner, Richard Hicks. His body was later found in the River Humber. Baby Lily was the only survivor. Today's funeral at Grimsby Crematorium was, as the Catley family had requested, a celebration of their three lives. We're concentrating on the life that these people have lived and the, the positive and the good things about that life. One hopes that with people gathered together uh, that, um, that everyone is upheld and uplifted and given strength in some way to cope with the enormity of this tragedy. We need one another, you know, on a day like this. During the service, Joanne was described as a lovely mother to three beautiful daughters, a special person. Phoebe was remembered as outgoing and extrovert, Emma lovable and sweet. Both would dress up, their favourite outfits were fairy dresses. The tweenies song and postman Pat were played, the girls loved to sing along but often got the words mixed up. The minister said they would be forever remembered. The memories and, and the influences of, of those three young lives will live on in people's memory. The many floral tributes expressed the devastation felt. They included a teddy bear left by the girls' nursery. At the end of the service, the congregation was told, the world will be a poorer place without Joe, Phoebe and Emma, but it will always be a richer place because once they were part of it. That was Tina Gelder reporting on the final chapter of that terrible and tragic story. Well, a man who walked into an airport with a ball bearing gun in his bag was jailed for four months today. David Burrows from North Walsham in North Norfolk said he'd packed his bag not realising the gun was inside. Burrows, who's a father of two, will now have to serve at least one month in prison. Will Ventus reports. David Burrows on the left here was sent to prison today for what his barrister said was a catastrophic mistake. He went to Stansted Airport to fly to Alicante on business, forgetting he'd hidden a ball-bearing gun inside a compartment of his holdall to prevent his young son finding it. The pistol was spotted as he passed through airport security in January. Burroughs admitted possessing the gun at an aerodrome in contravention of the Aviation Security Act. The judge at Chelmsford Crown Court accepted that Burroughs had been forgetful, but said in the current climate, air travellers had a duty to ensure no weapons were taken into an airport. Burroughs' lawyer condemned the sentence. I think the uh, sentence was a particularly severe one, given the nature of the offence committed by Mr Burroughs. Essentially, it was an act of forgetfulness, omission, oversight. It wasn't a positive criminal act. But an Essex police spokesman said tonight, not only does this sort of response from the courts act as a deterrent against others, it also serves as public reassurance to both passengers and staff who have the right to use airport facilities without fear for their safety. Burroughs will serve a month in jail before being eligible for early release. Will Venter's reporting. Well, now it's time to join Christine, who's live in Wakefield. And Christine, I gather the uh, argument about speed cameras has been brought into sharp focus there tonight. 
Yes, it has indeed, Jeff. You join me on Aberford Road in Wakefield, a very busy stretch of road where residents here say there's an accident on average at least once a week. Now, you can see the problem here. Cars come at speed around this particularly sharp bend. They often lose control. They say only a speed camera can actually solve this problem. Now, we know that speed cameras aren't exactly popular with drivers, and today one of our top police constables, the police constable of South Yorkshire, Mike Hedges, came out with the controversial statement that speed cameras have actually wrecked his force's relationship with the public. Well, to find out more, Jonas Muller went to meet him. Yes, the South Yorkshire area was one of the first to introduce speed cameras. They were done while Chief Constable Mike Hedges was here. Um, frankly, they've been a disaster, haven't they, as far as relations with the public are concerned? No, not a disaster. I, I think the, the point I'm, I'm making here is that there is a place for speed cameras and we use them and in this county we use them wisely. I think what has been a problem is the way that the public perceive them. Uh, I think the very good work that they achieve in reducing accidents by reducing speed uh, is lost in the debate about whether this is simply another means of taxing the public. Because if you ask any motorist, and that's one of the first things they'll say, of course these speed cameras are there to make money for the police and not, not for another purpose. I think the point we have to make absolutely clear is, yes, some of the money does come back to us, but it, it, it's only a portion of it, and we can only use that to turn back into road safety. Before speed cameras, that work was still there. So, in effect, this is an extra income that's coming in. Yes, it is, uh, and uh, I was very worried about the, uh, uh, the perception that here we are, police are, police are issuing tickets to get money because their budgets are thin and they need to boost it to, to keep the force running. I took the measure of being personally satisfied that our use of the cameras were in spots that complied with the national criteria because as I said from the start we've always wanted to reduce speed and not issue tickets I'm afraid it's that debate that's got lost in this issue around personal taxation okay Chief Council, thank you very much thank you well Christine those are the views of course of the South Yorkshire Chief Council Mike Hedges but I wonder are they going to cut any ice with those people you've got uh, there with you now who've got very serious traffic problems of their own yeah, these are the residents of Aberford Road and they say they don't care whether speed cameras are popular or not. And this is the reason. Just take a look at some of these shots and this is the aftermath of just some of the accidents that have happened here over the recent years. Now, one of the difficulties is that uh, the council who decide where speed cameras go say they have to meet a certain criteria, at least four fatalities. While well, the residents here say that won't be long coming. Gail Mellers reports. Standing at the bottom of her driveway attempting to cross the road, Helen Hyden knows is a real risk to her life and the lives of her two young daughters. Every week, neighbours claim drivers come to grief on Aberford Road, often ending up in their front gardens. But it's not just the volume of traffic. There's a sharp bend before the houses, and although the limit is 30, there are no speed signs for miles. We've lived here for four years. For probably the first couple of years, there was only maybe one accident. And in the last 12 months, certainly, um, it's just getting worse. And we average about one a week at the moment. I've been thrown back onto the lawn in my own car. I've actually, next door neighbours on both sides have been bashed back into their own gardens. I've had a mini upside down. I've had an invalid carriage upside down in the road. All basically speed. Three weeks, four weeks ago, when uh, a BMW come off the road and ripped three cars off in front of the pub. And that was unbelievable. It was just chaos. I mean, uh, it, it was a miracle nobody were killed that night. After three incidents this week alone, residents say speed cameras is the only answer. But in South Yorkshire, the increasing number of speed cameras has proved unpopular with drivers who believe their main purpose is to earn revenue for the police. And in Lincolnshire, which has some of the worst accident black spots in the country, the use of cameras hasn't always proved successful. Whatever the controversy, the residents of Aberford Road say something must be done before more lives are lost. Well, I'm joined now by Karen Maguire, leading the campaign for a speed camera here in Aberford Road. Karen, you live over there where the cars tend to go out of control. What's it like to live in your house? Um, I actually like living here, um, but we constantly hear a constant screech of tyres and see some uh, pretty horrific ac accidents here. Um, and we've just come to the stage now where we don't want to see any more. What do you fear if something isn't done soon? 
if something isn't done soon, the council will get their four fatalities, which is what they require for a speed camera. OK, well, you've actually brought in John Carruthers here, who's an independent traffic consultant. You've done an assessment of the dangers here and whether you think an accident will happen. What did you come up with, John? I feel there's a need for urgent action at this location. There's a real risk of serious accidents. It's on a sharp bend, very steep gradient, an A-class road with a high amount of traffic every day. I really feel there's a, a serious risk of an accident. OK, well, let's put that point now to Philip Gwynn, who is actually in the organisation which is in charge of where speed cameras go in West Yorkshire. Based on what you just heard, is Aberford Road going to get a camera? Uh, the government set some very strict rules for where cameras can and cannot go. This road does not meet those government criteria. But why not? Because, as Karen's already said, there has to be a minimum of four fatalities or very serious injuries before cameras can be installed. We are forbidden by government to change those rules. But despite the fact that there are so many near misses, it does seem very cold and calculating to be so strict on the rulings. That's a question you must put to the Department for Transport who set the rules. All I can tell you is that we get a lot of similar requests. There's a lot of things we can do. Engineering work has been carried out on this road, but it does not qualify for cameras. So, Karen, it's all down to bureaucracy. Um, which I think is appalling. Um, we use this road to walk to school, walk to the local hospitals, and if it's one of our children that are killed, it's just horrendous to think that that's what it will take. It won't be the drunk driver who loses control or the guy who's stolen a car and is out of control. It'll be one of the children. I think that's outrageous. OK, thanks very much indeed, all three of you. Well, Jeff, uh, we'll be talking to some of the residents again later in the programme and discussing the merits of speed cameras, so do join us for that. Thanks, Christine. Look forward to talking to you later. Well, now, later in the programme, we'll be meeting the man whose good hair day got him a pay rise. But now, though, here are Fraser, Karen and Anne-Marie with more of the day's news from your part of the calendar region. Thanks, Jeff. It's emerged that the killers of a businessman may have fed him marmalade following an attack outside his home in Leeds. One theory is that the attackers believe John Looper had fallen into a diabetic coma. Police think he was fed marmalade after being attacked while walking his dog outside his luxury home in Allwoodley. Tests have so far failed to reveal how Mr Looper died. It's been revealed that jewellery found on a body pulled from a river in the Lake District is similar to that worn by missing teenager Shafilia Ahmed. 17-year-old Shafilia, who's originally from Bradford, vanished following a trip to Pakistan in September. She'd previously swallowed bleach after meeting her arranged marriage suitor. Police in Cumbria, where the body was found last month, are still waiting for the results of DNA tests to see if it is Shafilia. Her parents, Joe and Fazana, who now live in Warrington, have been questioned over her disappearance. The family and friends of a 13-year-old boy from Barnsley who died at a motocross venue last week have today paid him their last respects. Around 200 mourners attended Scott Conway's funeral in Goldthorpe. Scott, who's from Bolton-on-Dern, died from chest injuries after a collision with another rider at an indoor motocross track in Ecclesfield. His coffin arrived draped in flowers which symbolised his passion for motocross riding and his helmet was placed on top as it was carried into church. Two men remain on police bail. Selby Abbey has launched an appeal for donations in a bid to solve its cash crisis and safeguard the jobs of its staff. £35,000 needs to be raised in the next few weeks to meet the building's running costs. The historic church needs £50,000 to cover the costs for the year. If the funds aren't found, then jobs may have to be axed by the summer. Church leaders think that could have a devastating impact on the whole town. We've got a very... Uh vibrant parish here and this abbey is very strategically important to the town of Selby and its economy because our visitors number now over 30,000 a year. If we don't have the staff we can't offer the quality of service to those visitors that we do uh, and it means we wouldn't be able to host many of the events other than worship that go on in this abbey church at the minute. Barnsley Council's to use sweeping powers to clean up the streets in the borough. The local authorities already started pulling down houses in Kendray and other areas. It's now approved plans to tackle more dangerous and dilapidated buildings, which are the target of graffiti, litter and fly-tipping. It's hoped that this will help reduce drug-related crime and antisocial behaviour. Last year, the council had more than 200 calls to board up private buildings. 
Police demanding flood defences for a North Yorkshire market town have promised to step up their fight despite a blow from the government. Pickering came within a few inches of flooding earlier this month and dozens of properties have been damaged in the past. The government's now refused to extend the town's special status, which means flood banks are unlikely to be built. A former pit site in North Nottinghamshire is in line for a huge jobs boost after plans for a massive DIY store were given the go-ahead last night. Bassett Law councillors were unanimous in their approval for plans for a new B&Q centre on the site of Manton Colliery, which will bring around a thousand jobs to the area. The Manton pit was closed down ten years ago. That's all for me for now. I'm back later. Back to Jeff. Thanks very much for all that. Well, now, a new report out today says that this region is a hotspot for bogus callers who target the elderly. Help the Aged says that a thousand pensioners every week are being fooled by con men, but that many of those victims are simply too embarrassed to call the police. It is, of course, their information which could help trap those criminals. Well, Chris Kiddy has been talking to some of the victims who have been prepared to come forward. A day centre in Leeds, and there's no shortage of sad stories about the elderly being conned by bogus callers. Edith thought her caller had come from the council. They say, uh, I've been sent from the corporation to do something in your back garden. So I let him in, and he said, will you turn your television down? He said, will you make me a pot of tea? And while I'm making him a pot, pot of tea, he was in my kitchen robbing me. He pinched all my payments, and he took my pension book. Clarice thought hers had been sent by the window cleaner. I did a silly trick then, I let him in. So it says, I think I've lost uh, my diary with all the uh, addresses on. And I'm collecting the uh, money, as you know, for the windows. So I said, oh, I said, well, you better look then. I said, it might be on the floor. Of course, you see, I left my handbag in the chair. But why is this region such a hotspot for this type of crime? Where's Mrs Robinson? I mean, what are you Robinson? doing in here? What are you doing in here? I want here? to buy Mrs Robinson. It may be that Yorkshire is on the backbone of um, the motorway network through England, and it may be that the communities, the offenders conducting this crime, jumping off the motorway network, hitting that region, and then getting back onto the motorway to target somewhere else. The advice to the elderly is, as always, don't answer your door to someone you don't know or can't identify. Get a secure door chain fitted. And if you do fall prey to con men, don't be afraid to admit it. Well, let's cross to our London studio now and speak to Lisa Ralph from Help the Aged. Lisa Ralph, I guess the key to this problem is that so many elder people are just embarrassed to report these crimes. Absolutely. There's a very natural embarrassment, I think, for anybody at being taken in by a con trick. But particularly for older people, there may be a fear that if they admit to their friends, family, and worse, maybe the authorities that they have been taken in, they, they may think that they can't cope living independently at home. So this adds to the fear of reporting. So there's also the problem, I suppose, that very many elder people are very proud, they're very dignified, they just don't want to admit that they've been taken in. I think you're absolutely right there, and particularly to a young police officer, perhaps. But let's just remind people now on this, on this programme what sort of precautions they should take before letting anybody into their house. Absolutely. 25,000 older people in Yorkshire every year are successfully repelling bogus callers, and they're doing it by following the simple lock, stop, chain check safety advice. Always keep your doors locked whilst you're at home. One in five of you, of you in Yorkshire are not doing that. Always, if you have a caller, stop and think, are you expecting anybody? Before you open the door, put the chain on or look out the window to see if you recognise the caller and then check the identity. Always ring the company concerned to check that the caller is genuine and if you're not happy at all, ask the caller to wait or come back and make another appointment. Genuine callers won't mind waiting until you can have somebody with you. So the answer is don't let anybody into your house unless you're absolutely sure who they are. Absolutely, your home is your castle. Lisa Ralph, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And uh, just in case you missed that number here, it is again the Help the Aged Security Helpline number 01255 473 999. 01255 473 999. But now let's go over to uh, Mark Austin and Mary Nightingale to find out what's coming up in the national and international news. Hello, coming up on tonight's ITV Evening News, release from Camp X-Ray, all the reaction as America frees five of the British prisoners. Class rebel with a cause, why this pensioner is preparing to do time behind bars. Join us at 6.30. 
Well, that's all coming up, but right now, more of the day's news from your part of the calendar region. Thanks, Jeff. Now, 200 years ago this week, the world changed forever when the first steam train made its debut run. This is an exact replica of the loco, the Penny Darren, which pulled 10 tonnes of iron, 70 passengers and five wagons on a nine-mile nine journey in Wales. Today, the replica has been fired up at the National Railway Museum in York. It will go on public display at the museum's nine-day rail fest later this year. For now, though, there was a chance to make some last-minute adjustments. It's, it's hugely significant in the history of the world. It, it's astonishing. This started, the re this was the real beginning of mechanical power transport. Suddenly man could move faster than a horse. That's never happened before. Now, Barnsley Man is definitely feeling flushed with success at the moment because he's completed his marathon sit-down protest against the government. Peter Finnegan's friends and supporters counted him through his last seconds in his portable toilet. He's been there since New Year's Day. Peter, who lives in Bolton-on-Dern, has been protesting because the government doesn't spend a penny on funding children's hospices. Peter's a fundraiser for the Bluebell Wood Children's Hospice, which has yet to be built. And he spends the grand total of 1,000 hours in his loo, but now he's glad to be out. It feels very nice after 50 days, you know, uh, a 1,000 hours uh, protest uh, to, for the... Uh, children's hospices to hope that uh, it raise awareness is that these children's hospices uh, uh, are needed and uh, we need this one in South Yorkshire as quick as possible. Leeds United are taking legal advice after the Australian Soccer Association invoked FIFA's five-day ruling to ban striker Mark Viduka from playing in Saturday's big game against Manchester United at Old Trafford. Viduka failed to report for the Socceroos friendly against Venezuela last night, citing a hamstring injury picked up in last week's victory over Wolves. The Australian board refused to accept their explanation. It's all from me. Thanks so much. Well, now it's time to go back to Christine in Wakefield. Christine, an awful lot of people watching this programme tonight will have picked up fines and penalty points uh, thanks to speed cameras. It is a subject in which people have very strong views, isn't it? It is. It's a very controversial subject indeed. And as we heard before, the South Yorkshire's police constable is saying it's actually wrecked his force, its relationship with the public. But all these people behind me wouldn't agree. They desperately want a speed camera here where they live on Aberford Road because they say there's going to be a very serious accident soon if one isn't installed. Well, I'm joined now by Simon Collister of the charity Break, who believes there are other ways of actually getting the traffic to slow down. What ways would you suggest? Well, the past few years in, in Hull, um, councils have installed 20 mile an hour zones. What we've seen is traffic uh, casualties being reduced by over 60%. So 20 mile an hour zones are, are a key way of reducing casualties. And you, you believe, I mean, you've done lots of study into this, and, but pe people are very, very afraid of accidents, particularly where children are involved, and many children use this route. Absolutely. I mean, the Government's Health Development Agency recently carried out a study that showed that if you implement 20 mile hour zones across residential and urban areas throughout the UK, you're going to see a reduction in, in children being killed and injured by about 67%, and that equates okay. to about 13,000 children. OK, well, Peter Nicholson's here. Now, he's an anti-speed campaigner for South Yorkshire. Now, you perhaps agree with what Mike Hedges has said today, your, your Chief Constable. I most certainly do. Uh, I'm pleased to see that he's come out and said it after weeks of trying to get him to say this. He's actually said it today and I admire him for it. Because you're pretty anti the use of, of speed cameras, not aren't anti, you? Not anti-speed cameras. Speed cameras are essential. As an ex-traffic cop, I know that they are an essential an aid to road safety, but they're not the be-all and end-all. Far so, from it. What other measures would you suggest, then, in well, an area like this, for well, example, this where area, there's such a sharp bend? Yes, I mean, I've, I've had a couple of hours looking at this and I think it's a dreadful... Um, stretch of road but I, I really believe that a camera would not solve the problem here. Rumble strips, uh, better signing prior to the bend to make the drivers aware that danger's ahead would be the answer to me. A camera wouldn't solve the problem. Okay. Well, uh, Philip Gwynn is back with us now from the West Yorkshire Casualty Reduction Partnership who decides where speed cameras go. He's told us categorically there isn't going to be a speed camera here on Aberford Road because it doesn't meet the criteria. But you wouldn't agree that speed cameras have actually wrecked the public's relationship with the police, would you? Well, certainly not in West Yorkshire. We carry out a lot of uh, polls among public opinion. And I have to tell you that Overwhelmingly, 90-odd percent of the population of West Yorkshire are fully supportive of the Casualty Reduction Partnership and specifically of okay. safety cameras. Just very briefly, everybody, do you want a speed camera installed here soon or not? Yes! yes. Are you going to listen to the bureaucracy? Absolutely yes. OK, well, I think this is a debate that will go on and on, Jeff. Uh, I'll see you later. Bye-bye.
Thanks, Christina. Make sure you drive home within the speed limit tonight, as you always do, of course. Well, now, there can't be many of us living in this region who haven't experienced a trip to one of the East Coast's famous holiday resorts at some time in our lives. So, to bring back all those, hopefully, happy memories, a programme tonight here on ITV1 will be celebrating the joys of relaxing on those bracing beaches in days gone by. The Way We Were looks at holidays from Scarborough and Whitby right down the coast to Butlins at Skegness. Here's Andrew Knight. The 1950s and England's seaside holiday camps are in their heyday. Among them, Butlins at Skegness, one of the company's flagship centres, attracting thousands of people each year. On duty in 1957, the camp's official press photographer, Malcolm Trousdale, who also captured this portrait of the camp on film. It was a great year, a great uh, season. There was lots of fun, lots of activity. You were working in a social background. Uh, you were making people happy most of the time, and you were being happy yourself. Uh, it, it all kind of rubbed off on you. Everyone went to the East Coast, that's what you did when the factory closed down. There you were, on that North Sea, come rain or shine, it was great. And you can see more from the region's uh, film archive on The Way We Were, tonight, 7.30, right here on ITV1. Well now, do you want to pay rise? Well, a stupid question, of course you do, but what would you be prepared to do to get it? Well, one teenager from Grimsby has gone to what you might consider extreme lengths to get a little bonus in his pay packet, Fiona Dwyer reports. He looks clean and respectable now, but just a week ago, Luke Stringer looked like this. These dreadlocks took him more than two years to grow, and his amazing transformation is all down okay. to his boss, like who offered him a £1,000 pay rise, if only he'd cut them off. It became atrocious. It started off as reasonable, grew longer, he never washed it, hardly ever treated it, and he, he looked horrible. <laughs> He was 17, 18, 19 when he grew them. He's now approaching 20. He had to get rid of them as far as I was concerned. It took Luke four days to come to the dreaded decision and now if he wants to keep the money, he's got to keep his mop cropped. <laughs> yeah, he was dropping hints all the time that he wanted me to get rid of them and uh, I couldn't really refuse when he offered me £1,000. So, yeah, made the choice and got them all chopped off. I've got nothing to keep my ears warm now. I have to wear a hat half the time. These are his treasured tresses. He's keeping them because you never know when they might come in handy, especially when the boss is away. A very dangerous precedent for bosses everywhere, I'd think. Anyway, it's time now to go over to Joe Blythe and find out what the weather's going to do to us tonight and uh, tomorrow. So here's Joe. For low cost car and home insurance, whatever the weather, smart people. Thanks, Jeff, and good evening to you. A beautiful start across the region. Thanks very much to Neil Davis for this beautiful photo taken at Scarborough this morning. Blue skies for many of us and plenty of sunshine, but it has felt quite chilly today. High pressure has kept things settled and will continue to do so over the next few days or so. It'll slowly edge out towards Eastern Europe, that high pressure, but another area of high pressure is forming up to the north, which will keep things settled well into Sunday. Winds will move around to a northerly direction by the end of the weekend, and this could trigger some wintry showers as we move into next week. For this evening and overnight, generally dry with well-broken cloud. Perhaps more cloud developing down around the wash and into parts of Lincolnshire, but dry with a widespread ground frost as temperatures dip down to and below freezing. Winds remaining light away from those coasts and northeasterly. Now the sun rises tomorrow morning at 16 minutes past seven, setting at 5.24 tomorrow evening. Another bright and dry day on the cards for tomorrow with sunny spells, more cloud perhaps east of the A1 and at the coast, but generally dry and bright there too. And temperatures in the north of the region to around 
seven Celsius. That's about average for the time of year. Those winds brisk and northeasterly, so for perhaps feeling a little chilly tomorrow afternoon. Saturday will be dry with bright spells. As I mentioned earlier, Sunday there is the risk of those wintry showers, but still bright spells as those winds move round to a northerly direction. For low-cost car and home insurance, smart people. Budget! <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Well, that's just about all from everybody here on the Calendar News team this Thursday evening. I'll be back with a roundup of tonight's regional headlines, though, just before 7 o'clock. But now, though, it's time for the national and international news uh, with Mark Austin and Mary Nightingale. See you shortly.